where I said I wanted to conclude my remarks in moving the receipt of the Commissioner's report uh, with a message to the public generally and to those in particular who continue to assert that this Regional Council is either not doing anything at all or at least not doing enough to control nutrient losses in the rural parts of this region. And my colleague has also already adverted to that. So eight years ago there were no effective limits on nutrient losses in this region. Losses had gone virtually unchecked for decades and the farming community looked upon the prospect of having a, to obtain a resource consent to farm as an unacceptable intrusion into their property rights. Today, uh, uh, as we take this important step forward, with a robust control regime that gives effect to the National Policy Statement on Freshwater Management. There are now, and have been in place for five years, rules to control nutrient losses that have been devised in conjunction with the whole of the farming sector, as my colleague has just explained. And an increasing number of farmers have come to accept that farm management plans and Resource consents are a necessary part of doing business. And I said this morning, and I repeat it here, they are to be applauded for that and not criticised, uh, as some people continue to do. I have every expectation that these rules will over time go a long way to halting the degradation of our waterways and will contribute to the improvement necessary to make them fit for all the desired activities that the community wants. The attitudinal change just referred to is striking and is to be encouraged. It will be part of this Council's function to do that as part of its ongoing implementation and monitoring of the efficiency and effectiveness of the rules and I said I thought it was incumbent upon all of us to accept that things have changed for the better and that we should continue to be positive about that. The urban community too has a major part to play in cleaning up waterways and it is time for we urban dwellers to take up the challenge as our rural counterparts have done. Thank you. <laughs> the question recorded? Yes. Yep. Oh, no, you go ahead. No, you go. Mm -hmm. I'll just uh, draw my journalist hat. Sure. Yes. And, yeah, good. Um, look for this. So, um, this plan you've mentioned is five years in the making, essentially. How long has this been around or going around? Well, we, we started the work um, du during the pro pro progress of the Land Water Regional Plan, actually, but we couldn't make the plan change. We couldn't notify it until we had made the, the relevant parts of LWRP operative. Otherwise, we'd have had a technical difficulty with it still being... A, so I think you can say it's yeah. it's been yeah. in. That's not that's not fair. We we, yeah. we we got we got a nutrient cap in place in the Land and Water Regional Plan. Yes. We assembled a group of industry organisations who helped us define what good management practices mean in terms of land management, in terms of effluent control, in terms of irrigation practice, things like that. Um, we then asked a bunch of technical experts, scientists, computer people, to agree on the ways in which the overseer model might be modified to reflect those agreed practices. We then took their advice and wrote it into a set of legal rules, which we then took through public hearings. Yeah. The result of which <coughs> is now back in front of us. Yeah, so it's a massive, massive it's, it, it, collaborative it is process for ECAN as a council, and I guess um, for everyone, like ECAN staff, 
is there something to celebrate the fact that absolutely got yeah, absolutely yes. and i said that this morning yes. i haven't repeated it here mm. but i paid tribute to a number of of the leaders including the colleague on my left <laughs> uh, and uh, not only that, yeah, I think this is something that this regional council can be really proud of. Staff don't usually mm. applaud the passage of a council resolution, but they did today, and that mm. was lovely. Yeah. Mm. And um, so uh, there are some changes to the um, the notified version yes, there and are. submissions. Yeah. Um, you touched on a few, of, a couple of them earlier, I think. But um, as it can staff council were happy with those changes? Were they significant? Did they change? Uh, the one of them might be yeah. in particular and that's the change to the irrigation proxy. Mm -hmm. We're still not entirely clear as to what that means. The change was brought about actually by our own uh, staff uh, answering a question from the hearing commissioners about an anomaly as they saw it in the different types of irrigation that occur, uh, in this case it was the travelling irrigators, that haven't got the same control over um, water application as, say, the pivots do. Uh, they saw an anomaly there in the, in the technical information. They inquired of our staff about that. The staff acknowledged it was an anomaly, uh, but uh, their advice was to leave it where it was. Um, the hearing commissioners asked how the anomaly could be corrected if they were so minded. They were given that advice. They 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 were so minded to to correct it, and they've done so in the relevant part of the plan. And we are still working through the ramifications of that. It has particular um, uh, ramification for people with uh, travelling irrigators on both light and medium um, medium density soils. So now we don't know the answer to that yet, uh, but we will know it and that's one of the points I've been making about these rules not yet being in place. We've got time on our side to look at that, to consult with the people involved, Irrigation New Zealand and so forth, and see just across the region what that actually means, that change. The other changes, uh, I mean in the Lower Waitaki it's quite an important change for a number of consent holders there who were facing having to get a land use consent, having already got a water consent with sufficient controls on it to deal with nitrogen losses. So they don't have to get that land use consent now. That's quite important for them. Um, and uh, and the change about the ten, the the ninety percent of good management practice, that that helps the people and some of the people in the Hakataramia Valley as well. Uh, the other the, the other changes are, whereas the com commissioners moved away from the 20 hectares of winter uh, grazing control uh, to a percentage of the property with a maximum of 100 hectares. There are still some parts of the region where the 20 hectares still applies and in some of the other parts of the Waitaki they've gone to the percentage figure but they've limited it to 60 hectares instead of 100. And that's all to do with ensuring that the catchment loads that have been fixed by the plan and haven't been changed by the commissioners are maintained uh, going forward. Can I just add a point though? Yeah. Because I, I agree with um, the significance of the changes that Councillor Skelton's referred to. But beyond that, I'd like to make the point that. Um, Actually, I'm struck by the extent to which the, the plan we notified has not been changed, or put another way, has been accepted by the hearings panel. Um, a range of industry groups came and made submissions uh, on the plan. 
in, in many cases, I think it's fair to say endorsing the broad approach, but questioning uh, a number of specifics. Uh, whereas the hearings panel has come back and said, uh, no, it, in essence, what we put up uh, meets the tests of the Act, meets the tests of the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water Management, uh, fits within the Land and Water Regional Plan itself and the Regional Policy Statement that lies behind that. Um, they, they've upheld our use of good management practices. They've upheld our translation of those practices into modifications to oversee. They've upheld the use of the portal, the electronic interface that we're now um, requiring um, consent applicants to, to uh, work through. Um, that's that's a, a very significant set of architecture which they've signed off on from a legal point of view. Um, which now lets us use that in catchments that we haven't yet applied it to with confidence. Speaking of the portal, as uh, Peter, you mentioned that this was a New Zealand first, essentially. It is essentially a New Zealand first. Mm. I and believe that to be the case. Yes, there's, there's no other council that, that is yeah. modifying overseer in the way we are. There are other councils who are using it. Mm. Um, it's really the only um, relatively straightforward means of calculating nitrate losses at the level of an individual property. There are other models that would give you a calculation of nitrate loss in a catchment Catch, context. Yeah. Um, so it's been signed off for quite some time ago by the Environment Court. Um, that's, but the, what, that's the overseer model. Yes, yes. but yes. what we're doing is, is modifying it to reflect practices which farms could use but aren't necessarily using, and that's unique. But we'll need to use. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do, do, do you have a question? Yes, actually, well, I, join I, us I by all means. Really come, 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 no, come, come, come on, please. Come on. Well, well, yeah. well, perhaps, uh, I've got just the one question. I'll ask that, then we'll turn off. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I think um, you've answered... Basically, what I was going to ask, the, the one area I'm really interested in, though, is the Mahanga Kai values mm. introduction, which, which has been mentioned, and I really think it should be. So, um, mm. could you just comment on, on how that's come about and its significance? Matt? Well, it came, up, came about um, through, the, through the actions of Naitahu to some extent. Uh, they lodged submissions on the plan. Uh, and the recognition of those uh, in both the general rules and the slightly different way of some targets in the in the um, Waitaki, uh, are, if you look at the decision, they are all linked back to Naitahu's uh, submissions. So there is some real requirement to look after those values. Now it's just not a it's just not a policy hope. <laughs> it's a requirement now for people to do to do that and to address those issues in their farm management plans. There is a specific requirement for that now, and that's that's quite an advance. And then, as I said at the hearing, I'm also delighted that we've got the recognition of some historical uh, Mahinga Kai sites many of which are now under water <laughs> with, with the Benmore um, um, Lake and so forth, but they're recognised and their positioning is recognised in a map that's actually contained within the plan. And uh, those are important things for our relationship with NITO. Um, so is, you know, you're talking about good management practice and farm environment plans as being a requirement. Mm. Is the EK going to enforce these and how? And is there a time period for farmers to get in line with this? Yeah, 2020 is the, is the, is the current time for, for them to get into line with this plan. And yes, yeah, we will enforce them. 
because the farm management plans are conditions of the resource consents and they are to be audited and the auditing process will throw up uh, deficiencies in the exercise of those management plans and ultimately uh, if we need to then and people are not um, giving effect to them, they are in breach of their consent and enforcement provision, uh, enforcement can take place. Perhaps I could add hmm. just that the system that Peter describes um, is already has already been deployed, is, is being used um, across Canterbury, um, in particular it's being used by a number of irrigation schemes that are subject to their own uh, individual but in a sense, omnibus nutrient discharge limit. Um, a number of schemes have adopted the practice of requiring their customers or shareholders um, to complete farm environment plans. Sometimes the scheme has done that for them, um, which in a number of cases have already been audited. And in one case I can think of, I think they're already into a second round of audits. Um, using the same kind of system and the same kind of people as we will be using in relation to the individual properties who will be affected by these rules for the first time. So it, it's, it's been another project going on for the last 18 months, two years or so, mm. to get farm environment templates approved, farm environment plans completed, auditors appointed, audit systems uh, up, and, up and working. Um, but that has been underway, and it's that system that we will now roll forward. So we're we're not in a position where we have now to begin an implementation program for the food. starting with the blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. um, we we will be extending out a system that that we're already quite comfortable with. There are a couple of other things about that. Um, one is that for permitted activities, is a requirement to have a a plan, it's not a, it's not a farm environment plan, but it is a farm plan, uh, and it's to be prepared by a properly qualified person. I think, Olivia, there's been provision made for that. I think the property owner can prepare it, but they do have to specify the good management they, plan. They do, and, and there is provision for them to use qualified people for that. That's for the permitted activities. In the consenting area, of course, um, uh, they are required to have an farm environment plan as, as uh, described in the Land and Water Regional Plan. And I think I'm right in saying that the uh, requirements for the certifiers or the auditors has been strengthened there as well. So um, that will help to strengthen the auditing process uh, going forward for the uh, for those farm environment plans, it's all part of uh, of getting the rules up to speed, really. And I guess it says yeah. a lot about the collaboration that has gone behind the scenes leading up to this, the fact that industry is already putting in these farm environment plans with the management. Yes, process. yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, maybe this is a bit quirky, uh, but Go back five years, the phrase consent to farm was largely used by farming groups pejoratively. They would come along and say, you can't possibly be, be intending to subject us to a requirement to obtain a consent to farm, a consent to continue what we've been doing for decades or, or more. Uh, We've now been able, it, it, to me it represents in a small way an indication of the progress that's been achieved, that we can use the same phrase, consent to farm, quite neutrally to describe the requirements that we're now implementing. We're not trying to score a point, we're not trying to, uh, to sort of ironically remind people of the, you know, the distance that they, they've travelled. It, it, it seems like the appropriate phrase to use. Um, and it's overwhelmingly been accepted by the farming community. Um, I, was, I was at a seminar, 
I can't date it exactly now, but it would have been four or five years ago out at Lincoln University when the chairman at the time of Irrigation New Zealand said, farmers need limits. Um, he was sticking his neck out a bit when he said it, but he said it very deliberately. It was clear at the time. Um, and I think that while that was a bold statement to make then, it, it's, it's a statement that few would argue with now. Um, this isn't the first round of limits, it's at least the second. Um, but it, 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 it sets the parameters within which uh, farm owners, um, farm managers will, will work. Uh, and I think that has over, the need for that has overwhelmingly been accepted, uh, as has almost all of the detail.